Attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings and welcome to this DCMI ACES joint webinar. My name is Stuart Sutton and I'm the Managing Director of DCMI. It's my pleasure this morning uh, to introduce both our presenter and the joint webinar series. The joint webinars are provided as a service to the memberships of both DCMI and ACES and to guests. The webinar series goal is to advance both the discourse and innovative practices of metadata. Today's presenter is Andreas Rauber. Uh, Andreas is an associate professor in the Department of Software Technology and Interactive Systems uh, at the University, uh, Vienna University of Technology and also co-chairs the Research Data Alliance Working Group on Data Citation. He'll be talking today on the recommendations of the Working Group on approaches to making dynamic data citable. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions of Andreas at the close of the webinar by entering them as text into the available question entry box. Uh, should we be unable to answer all of the questions, in the time we have available to us today, um, they will be made available to Andreas for responding offline. So, welcome Andreas, and I turn the podium over to you. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, depending on where you are joining in from. Um, thanks for joining this webinar. Um, what I'll try to do is in the next 45 minutes to an hour is to give you an overview of the challenges and the work and the recommendations that we have developed in our RDA working group over the past year. All of these are still in, in draft mode, so they haven't been finalized yet. We have about half a year to go to finalize the recommendations. So we're also looking for feedback, comments, ideas, and questions from your side to help us you know, really shape them, these recommendations well, to make them useful. Um, what I'll try to do um, is start with something that's not directly a, a result of our working group, but of a larger initiative, which is the Joint Declaration of Data Citation Principles that I assume many of you will be familiar with, but I'd just like to briefly rush through them to give those of you who have not heard of those um, data citation principles, to give you some kind of context on the general data citation field. And then I'll dive directly into the two core challenges that we have been dealing with in the context of our working group, which is dynamic data and subsets of data. And I'll try to show you where the challenges are before then leading over to the recommendations that we've developed. And then at the end, I'll, I'd like to show you some of the pilots or discuss briefly some of the pilots where we have been evaluating those recommendations so far, show you some implementations, um, which should, I hope offer a good basis for seeing them work in practice and you know, analyzing the you know, advantages, disadvantages, and complexities of the proposed approach. And then, yeah, there's a short summary and hopefully a, a long and intensive discussion following afterwards. Um, just very briefly, the Joint Declaration of Data Citation Principles was created by the Data Citation Synthesis Group, a group of basically representatives from a lot of different projects and initiatives, all dealing with different aspects of, of data citation. They were created a bit more than a year ago. Um, they're online and you can endorse them online. So those of you who haven't done so and who are interested in, in data citation and you know, would like to foster data citation, I encourage you to take a look at them and endorse them, either individually or as an institution. But before doing so, if you're not familiar with the principles, I'd like to very briefly just show you the, the eight principles that this group has come up with. Um, the, the first principle is basically, and they, they're pretty much common sense principles once we've agreed on you know, how to phrase them. But basically, the, the first step that, you know, data should be a first-class citizen in science in, or yeah, in, in general and does have the same importance as publications. By the way, the, the underlinings that you see on the slides are my own, so they're not part of the, the official text. Just trying to highlight some of the 
key aspects that that I um, that I consider important in each of those um, recommendations or principles. So the first is that data is is important and should be considered at least as important as as publications. And data citations should be used to not only identify the data that was uh, being used in a study as a basis for the underlying findings, but also to allow giving credit to whoever created the data, provided it, curated it, and so on. Um, the third is one of the key principles, I'd say, which is um, that whenever a claim in a scientific statement in a publication relies upon data, that corresponding data should be cited so that people can then identify it, locate it, and you know, go back to it and use it really as a basis for validating the, the claim. In order to do so, um, we should have a persistent method for identifying the data, so a persistent identifier. And here, one of the key aspects, I think, is that the fact that it should be machine actionable. Um, as we move into e-science, and that was also one of the driving motivations of the work in our working group, we increasingly find that data is being published and cited not so much for the benefit or not solely for the benefit of a human reader who you know, reads a citation text and looks it up somewhere then in a repository, but predominantly for machines to process those data citations automatically so that meta studies can be done more easily by harvesting the publications or harvesting research results and being able to automatically go to the underlying data collected if permissions are granted and perform meta study. So this machine actionability is for me one of the key criteria beyond the fact that it should be globally unique as an identifier and preferably widely used by a or the target community. The fifth principle is um, that it should facilitate access to the data, but also to associated metadata documentation code that is either underlying the data or has been used, applied onto the data, so that we can make informed use of the data. And again, I'd like to stress the fact that it's both for humans and for machines to make use of the data and the underlying information. And we'll talk a little bit about associated metadata also in the context of the data citation recommendations coming out of this working group. Um, the sixth recommendation addresses persistence, which says that the identifier and the metadata that it resolves to should persist even if the data itself should not be available anymore. So if at a certain point in time, because of economic reasons, storage reasons, whatever, the data becomes, gets deleted, is no longer available, the metadata underlying the data should persist so that we can identify what this citation originally referred to. So there is no commitment to keep things forever, just as a hard promise to make, but we should try to keep at least the metadata describing the data. And the same thing will apply to the dynamic data citation that we'll be talking about for a little, in a while. Finally, there's specificity and verifiability. Um, this is the, the key aspect here is that it should identify the specific data that supports a claim, and this is even uh, specified more frankly, given as the time slice version and or granular portion, so to speak, this the subset of the data that was used in a specific study publication. And this is one of the key aspects that we addressed within the RDA working group, which is finding a means to be able to cite a subset of data or a specific version of data in settings where data is changing potentially continuously so that we can really go back to the data as it was used in a specific study. So that's kind of the key um, principle or recommendation that we will be discussing 
in the second half of the, in the second part of the talk. The eighth principle is that um, we agree that there is different practices amongst communities on how to perform data citation, and we should try to be <laughs> as as common or as interoperable as possible. But um, yeah, we agree that there will not be a single standard way of citing data across all disciplines, across all types of data, across all sizes and scales of data. So we will find different implementations, but the principles should be if possible interoperable. That's also one of the aspects that we want to address within the working group to ensure that data citations are stable across changes in technology when we change from one database system or data representation to another. So this was just very, very quickly um, kind of setting a context, this joint declaration of data citation principles. And I, I really encourage you to take a look at them. And if you haven't done so yet, um, you know, endorse them. Because I think it's, it's an important step in taking data citation further uh, to, to honor the, the value and also to ease um, research and scientific discovery in the e-sciences. But now to the concrete aspects that we've been working on in um, our working group, which I call challenges in, in non-trivial settings. Now, what are these non-trivial settings? Basically, citing data may seem easy, and we've seen data being cited in numerous publications, either as a footnote, um, to whatever a data set being provided or listed somewhere as supplementary material or being properly cited um, in the reference section of a paper. There's all different ways of you know, identifying a data set. So what's, what's the problem? Why do we need a working group to address data citation? But first of all, um, most data sets that are being cited today and that we find cited in, in papers have to be static if we want to go back to the data. So we either reference a file or a database where you can go to and download the data. And if the data is static, that's fine. We can download the file, we can access the database, and we'll get back to the, to the data as it was used in the study. But what we find in many research data settings is that the data is dynamic. New data keeps being added, sensors spit out new values as a continuous data stream. Um, for data that has been entered already in any kind of database or data representation, we frequently find that the data gets later on corrected, errors are detected, data quality is being enhanced. So what we find is a lot of updates happening to a database. And this can be very regularly, so whatever on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis, but it can also be highly dynamic at irregular intervals. A researcher notes an error in the database, corrects the data value, and continues working with the data. Now, if somebody has used an earlier version of the data before, how can we ensure that if you want to verify a claim or if you want to go back to the original study or if you want to apply a new algorithm on the same data as was used in the previous study, how can we ensure that somebody can get back to the data as it was at that given point in time? What we do find currently is that people identify the entire data stream without any versioning, and that's pretty much useless. So citing a source somewhere on the internet, and even providing an accessed at date, you know, downloaded or database accessed on the, whatever, 8th of April 2015, is of no use to somebody half a year later unless he can ensure that he can go back to that version of the database as it was on that day. Another approach that we find frequently in, in different um, research infrastructures is that data is sometimes artificially versioned by identifying batches of data, so doing quarterly, monthly, or annual releases of data. And any changes that happen in between are being collected and then released with the next batch version of the data, which is kind of an unnecessary time delay. So what we would like to have, and this was one of the goals of the working group, is a means to cite the data as it existed at a certain point in time. 
without artificially introducing time slices or time slots when changes and additions to the data are, are allowed to be made. So that was the first setting. So really being able to identify data when it's dynamic. The second aspect is the granularity of data citation. Um, and it's not only in big data settings, but basically in, in a lot of even smaller scale databases is that databases collect an enormous amount of data over time. And it's very rare that researchers use the entire database for their research. Usually they select a subset of the data. This can be certain measurement values, this can be certain time slices, and these are then used for a specific study. How can we cite that arbitrary subset of data that was used in such a study? Um, the approach is being taken currently is that the researcher creates an export or a dump of that subset as used in the study and stores it either together with the paper or in a separate dump again in the database. That works fine as long as the data sets are small, but if you have a whatever four page uh, paper and a terabyte of data to store with it, that doesn't scale very well. Another approach that we find conventionally is that people cite the entire database and then they provide a verbal description of the subset that they selected. So say, okay, we use measurement values 15 to 25 and we use time slice from whatever, the 15th of January until the 25th of March, certain year. This is fine, but this first of all requires a human reader usually to interpret it. And in most cases, it's not precise enough. So if we simply take the, consider the example of the time slice, if I say I'm using data from the 1st of March until the 25th of, of April, does that include the 25th of April, yes or no? Is it an open or closed interval, for example? Um, what about different time zones? Um, do I specify the time zone that I was in when I downloaded the paper, uh, the, the data? That doesn't scale terribly well and it leaves a lot of ambiguity, making it hard for researchers to recreate exactly the same data set or the same subset. Um, another approach that we've seen is storing a list of record identifiers. So you're really listing all the data tuples that were used. This doesn't scale terribly well if you use millions of data tuples and it becomes completely impossible to implement when you do not select the entire record but sub-elements, only specific measurements of each record. So what we wanted to have as part of the solution is a mechanism that allows us to cite any arbitrary subset of static or dynamic data used in a study. And this arbitrary subset can be as big as the entire database or it can be as small as a unique single number. And we would like to have a single mechanism for doing that rather than having different approaches for different you know, sizes of data being cited. So to summarize briefly the requirements, we want to be able to deal with situations where the data is dynamic, so where new data keeps being added, where existing data can get deleted, corrected, where we want to be enable citation of arbitrary subsets of data, rows, columns, time sequences from a single number to the entire set, and where the solution should be stable across technology changes because we are well aware that we won't be staying with one data management system for the next 10, 20, 50 years. We will have technology evolution, we will be migrating to new databases. Um, and probably as a side note, when I say database, um, we usually use as an example SQL style, SQL style databases because they are amongst the most common ones being used for research data. But in general, and I'll try to show some examples later on, we want this approach to work for in inverted commas any type of data representation, be it SQL SQL data, be it XML databases, um, linked open data, comma separate value files, graph databases, file repositories. We want to have a single mechanism um, that works, or at least principles that work across all of these types of data representation. We want 
the citation mechanism to be machine actionable, not just machine readable, because almost anything is machine readable, and definitely not just human readable and interpretable. And it should be scalable to very large data, to highly dynamic data sets, but it obviously should also work for small and or static data sets, so that we don't have you know, different principles applying to different types of data. And this was kind of the, the setting that we found ourselves in when we established the working group. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs together with Ari Asmi and Tietfeng Utkwangin. Um, the working group was officially endorsed in March 2014. It runs for 18 months, so we are just past our first year, in which we have come up with, you know, the kind of formulating and formalizing the challenges, coming up with a recommendation, and we are now moving into testing, validating the recommendations, and, you know, finalizing to put them out for public comment. Um, one of the key aspects that uh, we decided very, very, very early on when we established the working group is that we wanted to focus. We really wanted to focus on a predominantly technical mechanism for how we can enable citation or actually even more precisely identification of specific subsets of data in potentially dynamic environments. Things that we decided on purpose not to discuss within this working group is which PID system to apply, whether it's URIs, ARCs, DOIs, um, URNs, and you name it, um, that, that should be transparent to the system. We also do not discuss in detail what kind of metadata to assign to a data citation beyond the ones that we deem necessary for verifying the correctness of our citation. We also discuss only marginally what kind of citation string should be used and how we can um, compute attribution and credit giving to different um, stakeholders in a data generation process or in a data curation setting. Those aspects are being dealt with by either other working groups or one of the other numerous initiatives on, on data citation. We really wanted to keep us focused to be able to develop something within the 18 months that we've got and be able to then link up and integrate other solutions. So, so far for the challenges. Um, now, let me move actually straight on to the solutions. And I'll first explain them very simply in a kind of intuitive setting, and then I'll move on to the draft version of the, the recommendations. The principles that we have is um, that we have data stored in some form, in some kind of database, in some kind of data representation, SQL, XML, linked data, graph database, file repository. And we have some means of accessing the data. So there is some form of query language. This can be um, the listing of a directory, this can be SQL, Sparkle queries, um, you name it. The two key principles that we have for enabling that kind of data citation is first that the data must be timestamped and versioned so that we have kind of historization of changes happening to the data. That means that any data item that gets added to the database is added to the database with a timestamp so that we're able to identify when it had become available to the user. Any changes to existing data, any deletions are not actually overriding, overriding those original values or deleting the original value, but being marked as deleted and then reinserted as a new value, again with timestamp. And this kind of database versioning is pretty much standard technology. We found it already present in many of the research data settings that we've had a look at so far. Now, once the data is timestamped and versioned, when a researcher creates some kind of working set or a subset of the data via some kind of interface, some workbench, the researcher uses that workbench, creates the subset they want to work with, and the moment that data is then being, whatever, downloaded or fed into an analysis process or being frozen, then we assign a persistent identifier, not to the data, 
but to the query string that was used to select the subset of data. And this is why the working group is dynamic data citation, because we are not assigning a PID statically to data, but we assign a PID to query string that is then dynamically executed in order to get to the actual data. And we assign that query with a timestamp when it was executed, so that we can re-execute it against the version and timestamp database. And there is some further details, I'll go into more detail about that in a moment, on rewriting the query so that we normalize it, so that we can identify identical queries, because we want to make sure that we assign a new persistent identifier only to a query that is, or to a subset of data that is new. And we also compute a hash key, a hash function, over the result set, so that when we then re-execute the query at the later point in time, we're able to verify whether the data that we get out of the database is actually the same as was seen by the researcher originally. So that's the key principle. In, from a deployment side, it looks like that, that the researcher uses a workbench to identify the subset of data. When they then execute the selection, so whatever, call it download or send data to analysis, um, the query is timestamped and stored. A persistent identifier, such as the DOI, is assigned to the query. A hash value is computed and stored in the query store. And <laughs> we have the recommendation to put up a recommended, recommended citation text on the web page so that users can actually copy and paste the citation text directly into the paper to encourage also making use of the citation. Now, once the set, this persistent identifier of the subset of data is being um, called upon from a paper, this PID resolves to a landing page. That landing page then provides detailed metadata on the subset, so who created it, when it was created, potential textual comments, um, anything on access rights and so on and so forth, plus a link to the parent data set so that there is credit being given both to the creator of the subset as well as to the data center or to the entire database. And we have then the option to retrieve the original data, the current version, or the changes. And when we activate the persistent identifier, then the query is re-executed against the timestamped data and the results are returned. I'd like to highlight two key advantages of that approach that were not originally planned when we devised the solution, but that turned out some very neat feature of this approach to data citation. First of all, by storing the query string that was used to select the subset of data, we have excellent semantic metadata describing the subset, because the query gives kind of the boundary conditions of what kind of data was included in the data set. So it gives the date from to, it lists the measurement ranges, it lists the cutoff values and thresholds for data to be excluded as outliers. This is all part in, of the query string. And this provides a description of the data, which is much better than just having a data dump without knowing how the data was generated. And the second neat advantage of this approach is that we can re-execute the query with the original timestamp when it was first executed. And this allows us to access the data as the researchers saw it at that point in time. But we can also re-execute the same query, so the same semantic selection criteria, with the current timestamp. And this allows us to get the semantically identical data set but applying all corrections, changes, updates to the database that have happened in the meantime. This is actually a neat benefit over just storing the old data dump, where it's impossible to see whether any changes have happened and what the impact of those might be. And obviously, once we can get the original and the current version, we can also get the, the changes or the difference between the original version and the current version. So those are two very, very neat benefits that we get via this dynamic citation approach. Now, a bit more um, formalized, 
um, the recommendations, and these are in draft mode, so these haven't been published yet. They will go up on the web very soon for, for public comment. And we need to um, work on the wording, so please don't take um, the, the individual words as um, you know, cast in stone or anything finalized, but just to convey the idea. Um, recommendations f um, summarized on four slides. In order to support that kind of subset identification, what needs to be done on the system side? First of all, we need to ensure that the data is time-stamped if the data is dynamic. If the data is sta static, only published once, never changes, then there's obviously no need for timestamps. The same applies to versioning. If there is updates to the da data, then and we need to go back, we, need to, we want to enable going back to previous versions of the data, then we should not override existing values, but mark them as deleted and reinsert them with a new value. Again, both timestamped. The only thing that we need to add in any case is, in addition to the data stored in the database, we need to add a query store where we store the queries and the metadata, which is hash keys and so on. That's what has to be done on the system side. Note that step items one and two, so timestamping and versioning, is already pretty much standard in many research databases, at least in the um, relational database world. We've found many settings where we have run workshops where the data manager sometimes were not sure of it, but where the technical people said, yes, we have timestamping and versioning implemented anyway by default. It wasn't it's just not being used for any any purpose at the time being. It is a bit more challenging for XML-based data, linked open data, but uh, in general it can be done. Second part, on the citation level. And here it becomes a bit technical and, um, well, well, I'm not sure in how much detail I should go here, but basically what we usually recommend is to rewrite the query to a normalized form. So um, editing the query string, uppercase, lowercase, um, standardization of, um, of synonyms and so on, so that we can identify if the same query has already been issued before. Also, a specific set that we recommend doing is to implement a standardized sort on the data prior to any user applied sort. This is due to the fact that most database systems are set based, meaning that upon a query they return the same set of data, but not necessarily in exactly the same order, unless the user has specified a unique ordering. In cases where the user does not specify unique ordering, re-executing the same query might lead to the same data being presented in different order. This might not be a problem in many settings, but in some settings where the subsequent processing is sequence-based and depends on the input order, we want to ensure that the ordering is identical. So we can rewrite a query applying a default sort first and then applying any user sort. Then we recommend computing a hash key on the normalized query to look up in the database whether that query has been issued already. Um, next step is um, assigning a timestamp to the query, and here there's three different options. Either we assign the execution time, or we assign the timestamp of the last update to the entire database, or the last update to the subset of data affected by the query. All three of them lead semantically to exactly the same subset of data. Um, it's, it's more a question of beauty, which one is more meaningful, and I tend to opt currently for the second or the third option as being the most meaningful, meaning that this is the data as it was at that time. Then we recommend computing a hash key of the result set, either over the entire result set or over row and column headers, so that we can verify later on when the query is being re-executed that the result set is really is identical, or to identify if something has gone wrong. Then, if the query and result set is new, so if the query has been re-executed and leads to new data, then we assign a persistent identifier to the query, store the query and the metadata in the query store. When a specific subset is requested, the PID resolves to the landing page of the subset, providing metadata, including a link to the superset, and the landing page then allows to transparently and hopefully in a machine action manner retrieve the subset by re-executing the query, either, as I said before, with the original timestamp or with the current timestamp retrieving the 
same data but including all updates. And again, stressing the fact that the query string provides pretty nice and comprehensive provenance information on the criteria that the subset of the data satisfies, which is a neat side benefit. If we ever need to modify the data management system, so migrating it to a new database schema, migrating it to a different database representation, such as from whatever a relational database system to a linked data system, then we need to migrate the data and at the same time migrating the queries so that they can be re-executed. Mind that we likely will need to adapt the hash keys for the new query strings to recompute them to identify if a query has been issued or read before. And we may need to adapt the hash input function of the result set if the data is being returned in a different representation by the new database system. If it's returned in the same way, via the same API, no changes are needed. And we obviously recommend that the migration of the queries should be verified by re-executing at least a reasonable subset of the queries to see whether that migration has worked. But that's pretty much standard um, wisdom for data and database and schema migrations. You need to check whether the system still works. So this is basically um, the concept. So what we did in the working group is devise this concept, identify the challenges, come up with this recommendation, and then we started evaluating that solution conceptually. So discussing for different types of data, how can we apply timestamping and versioning? How can the query rewriting bin be performed? Um, what is the impact of the changes? How much effort is it to implement those changes within different research infrastructures? And so what we have done is we've started implementing different pilots, test cases for different types of data to see whether the ideas that we have sketched actually work. And what I'd like to do now very briefly is run you through some of the pilots that we have taken a look at as part of the working group. Some of them came from different European Union research projects. Um, NERD, the UK Natural Environment Research Council data centers is working on one pilot. ESIP is taking a look at one pilot. Clarin is looking at a pilot in the XML data. VAMDC is looking at a pilot for distributed data. And what we have come up with so far is prototype solutions for SQL, so relational database management systems, for comma separate value files, partial pilots for XML, those are not finished yet. And we have some work on linked data and triple store databases in the queue. And we have some initial pilots on distributed data. Now, I'd just like to briefly show you some of these to give you an idea of how this is being done. So, first two pilots on uh, SQL-based data, relational database management systems. One was done together with the Laboratory of Civil Engineering in Portugal. This lab monitors dams and bridges for stability and safety. So they have, for a specific dam, the one that we used as a pilot, um, a number of manual and automatic sensors that measure vibrations, movement, temperature, humidity, and so on. This sensor data is being fed either automatically for the automatic sensors or in batches for the manual sensors into a database. Then there is certain analysis processes being run on the data to assess the stability of the bridge, the dam. Um, this analysis results are being fed into LaTeX to produce a PDF report that is being published um, and sent to specific authorities. And they obviously want to be able to recompute um, any analysis that has happened at a certain point in time to compare any changes or if they update the computational model recompute it on the old data to check whether um, the new model would provide a different view on the stability of a bridge or a dam. Another setting um, is the Million Song Database, which is one of the largest benchmark collections in music retrieval research, which is a huge set of features describing songs. There's a million songs described by different acoustic features, which range from 16 to 1,440 dimensions, uh, capturing rhythm, melodic features, um, beat, energy, frequency spectral analysis, basically. 
And researchers use this data set to train music classification algorithms, music retrieval algorithms, classifying them by genre, by artist, by mood, and a myriad of other um, criteria. And they usually select subsets of these working only whatever on Mozart's music or working only on audio recordings that are at least six second long, seconds long or removing recordings that don't have enough energy in a certain frequency spectrum and so on. And so what we did for those two pilots is to test how we can timestamp and version the data. And all of this is standard technology. So timestamping and versioning of SQL databases has been done for a long time and there is a pretty good understanding of what the advantages and disadvantages of the different approaches are. So we can either integrate the timestamping and versioning directly into the original database table, which is the most efficient way in terms of not wasting any storage space, but it requires to adapt all the APIs that access the data. For a hybrid solution, we keep the original database as it is. Data gets deleted from that database, and all that we need to do is when data gets deleted or updated, we shift the old record in a history table. That also is very storage efficient, but the queries then need to span both the active table and the history table. And the third solution is to completely duplicate the table, so to have one current table it has the current version of the data and a history table that is basically a copy of the current table plus all the versioning. That's the most efficient one performance-wise because all current queries, continuous queries go to the uh, operational database and only historic queries, so queries accessing earlier data, go to the history table. And those are kind of three ways of how timestamping and versioning can be implemented for this kind of database and the queries can then be rewritten. We designed a query store where we stored the persistent identifier of the query, the original query string as created by the user in the web interface, the rewritten query as the system rewrote it, and the hash key, the timestamp as was used for executing the query, the hash key of the result set, and some metadata that we collected for the pilot, like who created the citation and what kind of report it was generated for or what is the semantics of the subset of data used and a persistent identifier of the entire database. So in this case of the million song database or um, the sensor data database of Elnick. And just to show you, I mean this is not, not really crucial, but just to show you how this looks, if we have a selection from the million song database, oops, sorry. Um, if we have a selection of the, from the million song database and we select whatever the, the artist track ID and the release, and we select all songs that are tagged with classic and that have a duration of at least 120 seconds. Then this is being rewritten in the database system as selecting all the songs, but where the timestamp is smaller than the query execution timestamp and where the track ID is not um, being marked as deleted. This is just to show how that such a query is being rewritten in order to work on such a um, hybrid historized table. Now a second pilot that I want to introduce very briefly um, is common separate value data. Um, why? <laughs> this was not a data type that we considered originally talking about highly dynamic data and very large data sets, but very early on in the first meetings of the RDA working group, a lot of people requested a solution for common separate value data because it's well understood, it's widely used, um, so we decided to provide a solution for CSV data. There were two options how we could implement that. One was simply using Subversion or SVN or Git, a versioning system to store the individual comma separate value files, which would then allow us to go back to the data as it was used at a certain point in time. And that's still a very simple solution to the approach. However, this does not allow us to do subset selection. So we implemented a second tool, and this will be published as an open source solution that in the background migrates the data into a relation database and allows you to then select subsets that does the versioning and timestamping and then returns a comma separate value file again. So basically what happens is researchers upload comma separate value files, the system generates a database table structure, identifies a primary key, adds some metadata columns for the versioning and the timestamping, and then users can up upload updated versions of the file, they can append new data, they can delete data. 
And the access interface then allows subset creation and storing, obviously, of the queries. And I, I would have a, a screencast, but seeing that we are running out of time, I'll probably just show a few screenshots of the system. And we'll upload the screencast to the RDA website, and I may, can also distribute it to you um, after the talk. So basically, you can upload new data, or you can update existing data. Then you uh, give it a table name, how you, how you would like to, call, to name this kind of database. You then select the file that you want to upload. You specify a primary key. And then the background, it migrates that into a database that you can view. Um, you can then filter or select subsets of data. So select anything that's longer than whatever 60 seconds, um, anything that has been published in a certain year, and so on and so forth. You can sort the data by whatever, by year, by an ID, by a rating as published at some of the, and basically any metadata that you have on the, on the CSV file. And then you get a suggested citation text, in this case, whatever the creator of the subset and the time, um, the name of the subset created at a timestamp, a persistent identifier, and saying this is a subset of pretty much like a paper is being cited in proceedings, a subset of the entire database curated by, in this case, the same person, and again, the persistent identifier of the entire database. And then you can download um, the subset as it was at the execution time of the query, or you can download the subset at its current state, so including all adds and deletes. And you can also download, obviously, the diff and the entire database. And then if you press download, you get um, a CSV file that you can open. And here in the screenshot, you actually see a part of the SQL string that describes the respective subset. Whether you want to show this to the average user or not is obviously a design decision, because most users don't speak SQL fluently, so this might be rather confusing. Still, we would keep it as documentation of semantics in the background. And very, very briefly now, um, an example of a distributed data setting that has been worked on by VAMDC, Molecular Data Center, that has 41 heterogeneous and you know, distributed data centers that are all operated independently, that have different technology, but they all have one single access protocol, and they return the result in XML format. And you can either query each node individually, or there is a centralized portal where the user can query all 41 um, individual nodes in one central way. What VMDC did is they originally had no way to trace uh, any add additions and deletions, so there was no way of going back to an older version of the data. So prior to the plenary form meeting, which was the one in Amsterdam um, a year ago, um, they tried to implement this timestamping and versioning of the data. And then they started dealing with queries, you know, how can we handle this in a, in a distributed setting? Does each individual node then have to implement the query store, and how do we do that with timestamping? Do we need to have synchronized clocks across all 41 centers, which would be pretty complex and too heavyweight? And the solution that they have applied now is that basically the unique identifier is assigned centrally, and each client individually traces the queries being passed on to them and the local timestamp using a specific software so that each client can reproduce each its share of the query process. And then the clients return their individual shares and then the center uh, portal aggregates them. Currently, the query store is private because they have some confidentiality issues. Um, I can't comment on, on any details on this confidentiality aspect of it, but I guess it might be related to um, not revealing which data is being worked on by which re researcher. There have been several other um, pilots that we went through conceptually, that we tested, where we tried to discuss how could this be implemented for different types of data. I don't really have time to go through all of them, but let me just say that the, the thing that we found working best whenever we address such a pilot is that we run a focused one or two day workshop 
with um, that specific data center where we have some from some representatives of the technical people who run the database, some data curators, some data users so who know the semantics of the data and who know how they would like to cite data or what kind of queries they expect to post to the database. Um, get them in a room, run a workshop, um, see which options we have for timestamping, for versioning, understanding how many queries are being posted, how big are the result sets, um, to come up with design decisions of how this could be implemented. Um, yeah, and it's mostly by those focused bilateral meetings that we progress. So there is not a lot of discussion actually going on on the entire working group mailing list on a general level beyond discussing recommendations. Okay, so that was a lot of material compressed into a long but still very short time. Um, if you're interested, um, here is a few links to the working group, to the mailing list. Um, we have run very few web conferences, but we'll try to do more of these now that the recommendations are moving into the stabilization phase where we are now very actively collecting feedback on the recommendations. Um, also, if you have a pilot or would like to run a workshop, please let me or any of my co-chairs know. We'd be very, very happy to to assist in running a dedicated workshop or meeting to really go through it conceptually step by step for a specific data set. It really only makes sense if we discuss solutions on a very concrete example set rather than generic how can any kind of data being made, uh, you know, time stamped and versioned. This, the solution really has to be targeted to the specific data setting. And with that I'm at the end. Um, Previously summarizing basically that the goal that we want to support is to have trustworthy and efficient e-science that allows humans and machines to easily go back to the very specific subset of data that was used in a study, um, preferably fully automatically, so that they can feed it into an analysis process where we want to have um, a solution for dynamic data as well as for static data, high volume as well as low volume data, static as well as dynamic data. So one conceptual solution that works in all of these settings that allows us to identify any arbitrary subset from a single number to the entire database uh, with one mechanism. Um, it's being done by timestamping and versioning the data and by storing and citing uh, timestamped queries transparently. The user doesn't need to know that they are citing a query. The user cites the subset of data, the technology behind it, is via going via the query that's being stored. It allows retrieving the exact view of the data set as used or benefit the current version of the data. It provides nice provenance information. There is no need for artificial versioning or delaying or redundant storage of data dumps. So overall it seems to be a pretty nice solution that came out of the long discussions within the working group. Future work, we still need to work a bit on distributed data sets. Um, there's still a few very interesting open questions there. And also on data and query migration. What happens if we migrate a database from SQL to linked open data? How do we need to transform the queries? We know that it works conceptually if the query languages are of equal power, equal express, expressive power, which they usually are. But how to do it in practice and to understand you know, the complexity of that, we would really love to do a few pilot studies on that. With that, I'm at the end. I hope I haven't flooded you too much with information. And yeah, I'd be very happy trying to answer any questions you might have and collecting feedback, comments, um, criticism, ideas to help improve and solidify the recommendations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Andreas. Um, we are open for questions. Uh, you can enter your questions. There's a question entry box uh, that you can submit them and they will come in front of me and I will forward them on uh, to Andreas. We do have one here. Um, Andreas, assigning PID to query is a very promising approach. Could you describe how you normalize queries? 
Also, do you plan to make a database of queries accessible to users to make their searches easier? Um, okay. Um, normalizing queries, that's a complex problem. So basically the effort that we put into normalizing queries depends on the requirements of the data center. The main goal of this normalization of queries is to avoid somebody, so to avoid the system issuing a new persistent identifier to a query that's semantically identical. So if somebody requests exact, and I'm using as an example the SQL fields here, if somebody requests exactly the same columns in exactly the same order with exactly the same um, select criteria, then this would be identical. So that what we do is, for example, we order the select criteria within a query tree, because you can represent queries as trees, alphabetically. So that way, um, the selection criteria are applied in the same um, order. Obviously, we do not reorder the columns that are being selected, because the same query, same semantic subset, but presenting the result set in a different order is a semantically different data set. Um, so far for the query rewriting. Now, on making the query set publicly accessible, that again depends on the data setting. In some cases, we have, have had one setting where um, the data center requested specifically that the data and the query is not to be shared. So in that case, because there was privacy issues involved about somebody knowing that somebody else is working on exactly the same subset of data. On the other hand, if the data is open, yes, there is no problem with sharing the database of queries and providing access mechanisms saying, you know, who has been, for example, for the Million Song database, who has been working on Mozart music as well, or who has been using, doing a study on audio tracks using the same set of genres that I, that I want to work on so that we can work on a comparable subset of data. Yes. Another question. What if data is behind an authentication system? Um, same principles apply. In order to select a subset of data, you need to first log in to get to your workbench, then select the data. Then you get a person identifier, you can cite the data. The fact that you cite a subset of data doesn't mean that the specific subset of data is accessible to anybody in the world. That pretty much applies to papers as well. Citing a paper in proceedings does not imply that that specific paper is publicly accessible to anybody, to everybody, sorry. So access regime, accessibility of the data is separate from citing the data. What we want to enable is being able to identify the subset. Any clearance mechanisms that need to be passed in order to get access to the data are on top of that. Again, pretty much standard technology and standard settings. Thank you. Another question. Have data registries like CNRI and DOI been consulted on this and asked for their opinion on this approach? Um, well, we have been sharing these recommendations uh, in a number of workshops. We, have, we are now in the stage of, of writing them up and putting them out for wider comments. So what we plan to do um, within the next two or three weeks is to write up what you've seen on these four slides is brand new. That hasn't been shown. The previous stuff has been shown at the previous plenaries where members of those groups have been present and sharing their comments, um, which we've then incorporated. Now we are writing them up and putting them up for public comments so to co collect them in a more consistent and structured manner. But yeah, different people from different groups have been present at the various plenary meetings, at the RDA, at workshops where we have been presenting this approach. And there is two further presentations, there is a workshop in Garda in April and two further workshops of RDA Europe um, and another group in Amsterdam and in Karlsruhe in May where we are collecting more feedback. Thank you. Another question. I realize that this is a tangential question. Could you please briefly describe any experience you, you have had with making citations for proprietary data sets public, possibly similar to the case of uh, the VAMDC? 
Um, I'm not fully sure I understand the question correctly. I mean, making citations public, do you mean in terms of violating privacy issues or? I am not certain from the question. Okay. I'm not certain. Okay. So basically what we have is, I can briefly comment on a project that we have in an associated research lab where they are dealing with social science data and medical data and where they now have a dedicated project to understand what kind of metadata is permissible to be added to a data subset and a data citation and what kind of metadata should not be shown to users without specific clearance because it would violate privacy issues. Um, this becomes uh, immediately obvious when we consider any query selecting patient records for certain diagnosis and correlating them with certain age groups where the f way the query is being phrased might reveal sufficient information to identify individuals with a high probability. So that's a case where we would probably not reveal the, sec or the, the query text as such, but we could still publish the persistent identifier leading to the subset of data, leading, if permissions are granted, leading to a description of data that could potentially be shared publicly, but the actual query string, as well as obviously access to the actual data, would be behind a firewall for um, people having clearance only. Okay, another question. I'm wondering what thoughts you have on making data more discoverable in general, as related to this work on making it more citable, as well as, uh, as well, in particular, how would data dictionaries relate to data citability? Would you, oh. like, me to, would you um, like me to reread that one? No, it's, it's fine. I'm just trying to think whether I'm qualified to answer that question, because <laughs> this is actually... Um, one of the things that we discussed pretty early on in the, the working group is something that we would not be tackling as part of the working group. Obviously, your control vocabularies for describing subsets of data, for enabling or having a consistent description of subsets of you know, describing associating metadata to a subset description would be very, very helpful. However, we did not want to address within the working group um, any recommended representation or metadata schema or vocabulary because these are likely to be highly domain sp and community specific. So this is something that we obviously want to support. So we want to support discoverability of data and having a machine readable processable representation and description of subsets of data is obviously very helpful for doing that. But we would, did not want to embark on developing a standardized representation for it. Thank you. Another, do you have any use cases from data aggregators or data portals, those who provide access to the data but do not produce it? Um, we have use cases where the aggregator owns, um, hosts the data, so where it is collecting data from different data sources, putting them into a centralized database, and that's a pretty easy standard setting then. The use case by VAMDC is a more challenging setting, which is at this kind of aggregator setting, where you have a centralized portal, but that queries distributed settings. Now, I do not have insights into the technical implementation that they used at VAMDC, and I will be meeting them hopefully next month to clarify that. But the recommendation that we have been discussing in a similar setting was that each participating node should have its own completely isolated uh, own time stamp own versioning system and it returns so there is no need for heavyweight synchronized clocks because this does, would put a heavy burden on the centralized portal and on all participating nodes but each node individually runs its own time scale its own clock and everything and it returns the result to the central aggregator with its local time stamp and then the central aggregator stores its time stamp together with the various timestamps of the participating nodes, which it then uses for re-executing the queries when it redistributes them to the various nodes. And that should be the most lightweight implementation possible, also allowing each node to act independently of all the other nodes. 
Thank you. Let's do one more question. It seems that the system attaches the identity of the searcher to a query. Have you thought about making the ID privacy information optional? Queries without ID information can then be shared, and those with ID may facilitate collaboration. Um, yes, obviously. Obviously. Uh, I mean, as I said, we did not want to dive too deep into um, any metadata being assigned or recommended. Whether that ID is a user ID, an institutional ID, or an anonymized ID is something that really has to be decided for each individual data setting. We just need to come up with some representation that allows the data to be cited in a meaningful way. So having either the institution or the query portal act as the creator of the subset in a sense if the author does not want to be identified. Yes, there's all different options possible. Thank you. I believe uh, with that we will, we will close the webinar. Andreas, I want to thank you very much, uh, uh, both uh, for myself and for the audience on an excellent presentation, very exciting work, and um, uh, we look forward to uh, this next period over the next six months with the discussions um, around the specification and how it evolves. So again, thank you very much, and, and thank you to the audience. Thank you all Stefan, very much for joining me. Stefan, do you have any announcements before we close? To the attendees, the webinar will be made available within 48 hours of today's uh, broadcast, and the recording will also come with the presentation slides. And that is all for today. Well, thank you very much. All right. Everyone have a great day. Perfect. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.